Schmendrick came back a little before dawn, slipping between the cages as silently as water. Only the harpy made a sound as he went by. I couldn't get away sooner, he told the unicorn. She set Rook to watch me, and he hardly ever sleeps. But I asked him a riddle, and it always takes him all night to solve riddles. Next time, I'll tell him a joke and keep him busy for a week. The unicorn was gray and still. There is magic on me, she said. Why did you not tell me? I thought you knew, the magician answered gently. After all, didn't you wonder how it could be that they recognized you? Then he smiled, which made him look a little older. No, of course not. You never would wonder about that. There has never been a spell on me before, the unicorn said. She shivered long and deep. There has never been a world in which I was not known. I know exactly how you feel, Schmendrick said eagerly. The unicorn looked at him out of dark, endless eyes, and he smiled nervously and looked at his hands. It's a rare man who is taken for what he truly is, he said. There is much misjudgment in the world. Now, I knew you for a unicorn when I first saw you, and I know that I am your friend, yet you take me for a clown, or a clod, or a betrayer, and so must I be if you see me so. The magic on you is only magic, and will vanish as soon as you are free, but the enchantment of error that you put on me I must wear forever in your eyes. We are not always what we seem, and hardly ever what we dream. Still, I have read, or heard it sung, that unicorns, when time was young, could tell the difference twixt the two, the false shining and the true, the lips laugh and the hearts rue. His quiet voice lifted as the sky grew lighter, and for a moment the unicorn could not hear the bars whining or the soft ringing of the harpy's wings. I think you are my friend, she said. Will you help me? If not you, no one, the magician answered. You are my last chance. One by one, the sad beasts of the midnight carnival came whimpering, sneezing, and shuddering awake. One had been dreaming of rocks and bugs and tender leaves, another of bounding through high, hot grass, a third of mud and blood, and one had dreamed of a hand scratching the lonely place behind its ears. Only the harpy had not slept, and now she sat staring into the sun without blinking. Schmendrick said, if she frees herself first, we are lost. They heard Rook's voice nearby. That voice always sounded nearby, calling, Schmendrick! Hey, Schmendrick, I got it! It's a coffee pot, right? The magician began to move slowly away. Tonight, he murmured to the unicorn, trust me till dawn. And with a gong, and was gone with a flap and a scramble, seeming as before to leave part of himself behind. Rook loped by the cage a moment later, all deadly economy. Hidden in her black wagon, Mommy Fortuna grumbled Eli's song to herself. Here is there, and high is low, all may be undone. What is true, no two men know, what is gone is gone. Soon, a new catch of spectators began to come sauntering up to see the show. Rook called them in, crying, Creatures of night, like an iron parrot and Schmendrick stood on the box and did tricks. The unicorn watched him with great interest and a growing uncertainty, not of his heart, but of his craft. He made an entire sow out of a sow's ear, turned a sermon into a stone, a glass of water into a handful of water, a five of spades into a twelve of spades, and a rabbit into a goldfish that drowned. Each time he conjured up confusion, he glanced quickly at the unicorn, with eyes that said, Oh, but you know what I really did. Once he changed a dead rose into a seed. The unicorn liked that, even though it did turn out to be a radish seed. The show began again. Once more, Rook led the crowd from one of Mommy Fortuna's poor fables to another. The dragon blazed, Cerberus howled for hell to come and help him, and the satyr tempted women until they wept. They squinted and pointed at the manticore's yellow tusks and swollen sting, grew still at the thought of the Midgard serpent, and wondered at Arachne's new web, which was like a fisherman's net with a dripping moon in it. Each of them took it for a real web, but only the spider believed that it held the real moon. This time, Rook did not tell the story of King Phineas and the Argonauts. Indeed, 
he hurried his sightseers past the harpy's cage as quickly as he could, gra gabbling only her name and the meaning of it. The harpy smiled. Nobody saw her smile except the unicorn, and she wished that she had chanced to be looking somewhere else at the time. When they stood in front of her cage, gazing silently in at her, the unicorn thought bitterly, their eyes are so sad. How much sadder would they be, I wonder, if the spell that disguises me dissolved and they were left staring at a common white mare? The witch is right. Not one would know me. But then a soft voice, rather like the voice of Schmendrick the magician, said inside her, But their eyes are so sad. And when Rook shrieked, Behold the very end! And the black hangings slithered back to reveal Eli, mumbling in the cold and the darkness, the unicorn felt the same helpless fear of growing old that set the crowd to flight, even though she knew that it was only Mommy Fortuna in the cage. She thought, the witch knows more than she knows she knows. Night came quickly, perhaps because the harpy hurried it on. The sun sank into dirty clouds like a stone into the sea, and with about as much chance of rising again, and there were no moon or any stars. Mommy Fortuna made her gliding rounds of the cages. The harpy did not move when she drew near, and that made the old woman stand and stare at her for a long while. Not yet, she muttered at last. Not yet. But her voice was weary and doubtful. She peered briefly at the unicorn, her eyes a stir of yellow in the greasy gloom. Well, one day more she said in a cackling sigh, and turned away again. There was no sound in the carnival after she was gone. All the beasts were asleep, save the spider, who wove, and the harpy, who waited. Yet the night creaked tighter and tighter, until the unicorn expected it to split wide open, ripping a seam down the sky to reveal. More bars, she thought. Where is the magician? At last, he came hurrying through the silence, spinning and dancing like a cat in the cold, stumbling over shadows. When he reached the unicorn's cage, he made a joyful bow to her and said, Proudly, Schmendrick is with you. In the cage nearest to hers, the unicorn heard the edged shivering of bronze. I think we have very little time, she said. Can you truly set me free? The tall man smiled, and even his pale, solemn fingers grew merry. I told you that the witch has made three great mistakes. Your capture was the last, and the taking of the harpy the second, because you are both real, and Mommy Fortuna can no more make her you, you hers than she can make the winter a day longer. But to take me for a mount bank like herself, that was her first and fatal folly, for I too am real. I am Schmendrick the Magician, the last of the red-hot swamis, and I am older than I look. Where is the other? the unicorn asked. Schmendrick was pushing back his sleeves. Don't worry about Rook. I asked him another riddle, one that has no answer. He may never move again. He spoke three angled words and snapped his fingers. The cage disappeared. The unicorn found herself standing in a grove of trees, orange and lemon, pear and pomegranate, almond and acai, with soft spring earth under her feet and the sky growing above her. Her heart turned light as smoke, and she gathered up the strength of her body for a great bound into the sweet night. But she let the leap drift out of her, untaken, for she knew, although she could not see them, that the bars were still there. She was too old not to know. I'm sorry, Schmendrick said, somewhere in the dark. I would have liked for it to be the spell that freed you. Now he sang something cold and low, and the strange trees blew away like dandelion down. This is a surer spell, he said. The bars are now as brittle as old cheese, which I crumble and scatter so. Then he gasped and snatched his hands away. Each long finger was dripping blood. I must have gotten the accent wrong, he said hoarsely. He hid his hands in his cloak and tried to make his voice light. It comes and goes. A scratching of flinty phrases this time, and Schmendrick's bloody hands flickered across the sky. Something gray and grinning, something like a bear, but bigger than a bear, something that chuckled muddily, 
came limping from somewhere, eager to crack the cage like a nut and pick out bits of the unicorn's flesh with its claws. Schmendrick ordered it back into the night, but it wouldn't go.